I'm one of the fund managers at Ruffer. I co-manage a Ruffer investment company, which is a FTSE 250 uh, investment trust, which follows the core Ruffer strategy, focused on delivering capital preservation and steady positive returns. There are three core themes in the fund, as was the case earlier this year, where our protective assets are currently dominant. Tactically, we own assets in the portfolio designed to perform well and take advantage of a fall in equity markets. Half of the portfolio is held across long and short dated nominal bonds, derivative protection and cash. The derivative protection should make money as equities fall, volatility spikes and borrowing costs rise. The bond should make money if interest rates fall in a recession and cash will allow us to take advantage of the opportunities that these scenarios could present. Structurally, we own assets that will rise in value in a new regime of higher and more volatile inflation. 30% of the portfolio is in a combination of index-linked bonds and gold exposure. Both will help protect investors against financial repression, where we think interest rates could forcibly be held below the rate of inflation, which we think will be the long-term solution to sovereign debt burdens. The third part of the portfolio, while smallest in size, is also important, because whilst we're comfortable identifying what we think the risks are, we try not to put our finger exactly on the when, so we build a portfolio of offsets. Our offsets are currently made up of about 20% held across equities and commodities. And these are assets that should drive returns if economic growth is more resilient than we expect, or we see a quick return to nominal GDP growth after a shallow recession and in the event of policy loosening. We're very conscious that following three years of strong differentiated performance, year-to-date returns have been disappointing. So looking back at the last 12 months, the frustration really lies in the period between March and late summer, which was kicked off by the Federal Reserve's response to the US regional banking crisis. That saw an injection of money and liquidity into markets that was more than half the size of the support provided in the global financial crisis. This allowed markets to rally. The S&P 500 was up 13% and the FTSE All World about 9% over that spring summer period as the calm and fall in volatility that ensued allowed investors to re-risk by buying equities, creating an illusion of market strength that appeared to be at odds with deteriorating underlying fundamentals. Now, in that environment, our portfolio balance was wrong and our protections were painful to carry. However, since mid-August, as abundant liquidity has abated and the rhetoric from central banks about the need for higher interest rates ramped up, markets have begun a gradual sell-off. Since mid-August, equity markets have ground down, and that has been accompanied by a sharp sell-off in bonds, with yields reaching levels not seen since 2008. In this environment, performance has stabilised and overall portfolio balance has been much more robust. We're confident that the portfolio that would have made good money so far this year is the antithesis of the portfolio you want for the next stage. Now, trying to time this transition with precision would be extremely difficult and dangerous, hence why we've held our protective assets ahead of time. And what our track record demonstrates is both a willingness and ability to position ahead of time has ultimately been rewarded. Since June, we've increased our exposure to bonds, the Japanese yen and to Chinese equities. Regarding bonds, as yields rose and bonds fell over the third quarter, in September and October, we materially increased our bond exposure in the portfolio, measured by an increase in interest rate sensitivity from four years duration to six and a half years. Specifically, we've bought 10 and 30 year US tips, which are long dated inflation linked US government bonds. We expect the rise in bond yields to dramatically reverse in a recession, meaning that these assets offer a potentially powerful source of prospective returns, given the inverse relationship between bond yields and bond prices. On the yen, the currency is at a 50 year low in valuation terms, And that's because Japanese rates are low and US rates are high. The currency weakened further against the dollar in recent months, and we've increased the exposure in portfolios. And it's now about 30% across our yen assets and derivatives. We think the yen will benefit from this rate differential narrowing. For instance, either US rates come down because of recession, or Japanese rates move up to tackle inflation pressures. And inflation in Japan is now ahead of the US for the first time since 1977. The yen should also appreciate sharply when we see market stress, as it's used speculatively by investors to borrow in the yen to buy risk assets elsewhere, which are typically in the US. Once speculators sell their assets and buy yen to repay their loans, it can cause a sharp appreciation in the currency.
Finally, Chinese equities, that they remain an important offset in the portfolio in case we're wrong about near-term recession. We've been adding to these holdings as more bad news is priced in, but we think the likelihood of government stimulus has been growing. As highlighted, recent portfolio activity has included additions to long-dated US inflation-linked bonds. At today's prices, we think they are an attractive tactical portfolio asset, given the macro fundamentals around recession risk, but also the absolute value on offer. The 30-year tip, for example, currently trades on a positive real yield of around 2.5%. It means that the worst case scenario for buying these assets today is 2.5% plus inflation, whatever that might be, every year until maturity. That's a challenging hurdle for every other risk asset. And the best case could be that the global economy enters a recession or market crisis, in which some combination of rate cuts and a flight to safe havens pushes yields down and we will see the capital value appreciate mechanically. If that happens, we can sell these bonds and rotate into bond out risk assets, so setting up the expected returns for the next period. Alongside the addition to bonds, we've also added to our credit protection, where we'll be the beneficiaries from rising credit spreads or borrowing costs, which have divorced from lending standards. We have exposure to this dynamic via credit default swap strategies, which are effectively insurance on defaults that will go up in value as borrowing costs rise. Banks have become less willing to lend, but borrowers are not yet having to pay up. Lending standards here have risen meaningfully, but credit spreads have not followed. We've seen a widening in recent re weeks, and that has driven positive returns for the portfolio, but we think we're still a long way off these assets, reflecting the wide array of economic and market risks. The other reason we like credit protection in particular is we think it's likely to work in recession, where defaults will spike, but also if bond yields continue to rise as corporate stresses grow, making it a good offset for our additional bond allocation. At the core of our thinking is it's extremely unlikely that the journey back from 9% inflation will be painless. To our mind, the least likely scenario from here is that markets, which have been rewired by a decade of free money, can reset to higher risk-free rates without dislocation. We think given the extent of the policy tightening, and this is showing the extremity and pace of those moves, with real interest rates now firmly positive, a hard landing is ahead for the economy and corporate earnings. We think that outcome has been delayed by the huge swathes of fiscal and monetary stimulus during the pandemic, rather than dismissed. Although the data is mixed, we think leading indicators are flashing red. Examples of these include credit conditions, as highlighted, but also manufacturing order data and concerns around the labour market, such as job breadth and hours worked. Whilst there are plenty of reasons as to why the impact of interest rate hikes has been delayed, such as pandemic savings buffers and fiscal stimulus, we're yet to observe a coherent argument for why the monetary policy transmission mechanism is broken and why we would deviate from 70 years of empirical data that suggests such policy tightening will induce recession. Alongside recession risk is the fact that we believe we're in an ongoing liquidity crisis. After 21 trillion of global money printing since 2022, we've been in the process of liquidity removal. Quantitative tightening and the ongoing movement out of bank savings and into high-yielding instruments is a continued withdrawal of liquidity out of financial markets, which was reducing investor capacity to take or intermediate risk. But even if these views around recession and liquidity risk are uncertain, what is sure is that investors are not currently being rewarded for taking on equity and credit risk. The gap between the income received by investors on US equities and US corporate bonds relative to cash is narrower today than at any time since just before the global financial crisis. Now, as a result, alongside owning assets we think will make money in a recessionary environment, we continue to hold a significant allocation to cash, which is paying us to wait for a more attractive time to take risk in these asset classes. Structurally, our view remains that from a political, economic and market perspective, the relatively benign and stable world that we lived in pre-COVID is not coming back. Our thesis has been for some years that the world is heading into a more inflation-prone and volatile era after years of historically remarkable stability. This chart shows you US and UK inflation in green and blue respectively, going back to Wall Street crash in 1929. It's very clear how unusual the stability of the last three to four decades has been, driven by China's integration into the global trading system, hyper-globalization and favorable demography, and the small state revolution in the West. But from the mid-2010s, we think we've been heading towards an inflationary regime, a process that was accelerated by the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
The return of inflation risk, we think, has profound consequences for investors and portfolio construction, because with it comes uncertainty, higher nominal interest rates, which in turn means higher risk premiums and lower earnings multiples, a less straightforward role for nominal duration, and an emphasis on non-traditional forms of protection, all of which we have access to within the rougher strategy.